we'd like to welcome you guys from Field to Plate with Larry Lewis today. I'm the host, Larry Lewis. It's a, a privilege to be here today. I know we're not actually in the kitchen cooking today, but um, some of my favorite things to cook is wild, wild game, of course, that's what show's about, but um, grouse, small game. And we're lucky enough to have today Zach Danks, which is from Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's our state wildlife biologist for turkey and grouse. Um, Zach's, he has free range today. You can discuss where you want to, but we're going to discuss about the grouse and um, mostly uh, grouse. And if he wants to touch in turkey, since turkey season's coming a little bit, that's fine. Kindly what the Fish and Wildlife Department's doing. and. Um, those that do hunt out there, obviously you know that there are very few grouse. And a few years ago, Zach could fill us in that the department um, hired a biologist just to get get some kind of direction the way they needed to go to help address the grouse population problem. Yep. I'll turn it over to you, Zach. Yeah, yeah. So uh, first off, thank you, Larry, for having me on. Uh, on the behalf of the department, it's great to get to interact and talk to sportsmen any chance we get. So. Really appreciate getting to be on here, and uh, I do kind of wish we were chowing down on the the uh, cook, cooking aspect of things, but yes. uh, that'll come, I suppose. Yeah. So, uh, no, yeah, I was uh, hired on almost uh, going on three years now, um, and really to head up efforts for rough grouse with the department. We hadn't done a lot on rough grouse specifically in several years, and so this was a chance. That uh, for the department to kind of launch an initiative focused on rough grouse, and um, you know, several people have uh, I've talked all over Eastern Kentucky the last few years talking to hunters, and you know, it really pains me that I can't we can't snap our fingers and make things happen instantly. It's uh, you know, just like grouse are the greatest challenge in the woods; they're hard to hit for a reason, and that's partly what makes us makes it such a great game bird and king of game birds to a lot of, course, of us. Yeah. Uh, that same aspect of difficulty also translates into management. They're, they're hard to manage for because it takes time. You know, it, uh, and, and that's something that a lot of us don't have. Increasingly, we have less and less time uh, in this day and age. And so being patient enough to do the right kind of management, first off, backing up, getting positioned to do the right kind of management, the right planning, make sure we do it all right and I'll talk about what that is here in just a second but uh, from a department standpoint working with many partners to try to do what we can all across East Kentucky uh, that takes some time and then once you do the work it takes time to develop in the grouse habitat so again time is, is, a, is a challenge but uh, specifically we have uh, kind of uh, decided on some WMAs that we think we have a good opportunity to manage for uh, for grouse. Uh, there are birds all across East Kentucky. Their numbers are very low. We all are yeah, aware of that. Of Luckily, the, the best thing East Kentucky has going for it is that it is a big forested region. And so compared to um, areas like, let's say, southern Indiana, uh, many grouse enthusiasts will have been following things and heard that they just recently listed rough grouse as a state uh, threatened species. So it's pretty bad when a game bird gets put on a, a state that, species yeah, list. Now is. that's it's not, got, it's not federally listed so it doesn't have any uh, mandates on it, um, but you know it's gotten bad enough in that area that they've, they've curtailed hunting several years ago and they're trying to uh, put some emphasis on it. But that area is a forested area but it's surrounded by big ag. At least East Kentucky has lots and lots of rugged hills and woods that what few grouse are out there can make it. So uh, hopefully when we do the right kind of habitat, the hope is that they'll, they'll be able to come back. So uh, you know, we're doing lots of different things on WMAs and I'd be glad to touch on those. Uh, sure. Uh, I was actually one thing, I was kind of jealous. I was talking to our uh, Northeast Regional Coordinator. Uh, <coughs> on the way here on the drive over and they were burning they were doing a control burn over at Yatesville Lake wildlife management area and uh, I think they had trying to burn about 150 acres wow. mostly woods and a uh, good day like this smoke would be carrying and uh, I'd be lying if I said uh, that'd be a wouldn't be a nice place to go back and try to turkey hunt here in a few weeks because 
after that stuff uh, starts to green back up, you know, it would be, be kind of nice. Tender but uh, but that's, that's one thing. Our, uh, the northeast region uh, with the department is very active with uh, prescribed fire. And that is, that is so important. It's really hard for a lot of us of, of our generation to realize it. But, uh, I mean, gosh, you know, we, we grew up with Smokey the Bear, and, you know, we don't want wildfires, but fire in and of itself can be a good thing when planned. And that, that was how the Indians maintained things and would have provided grouse habitat in the past. And so along with timber harvest, fire has a place, you know, sure. for, for wildlife management. And, and then in addition to that, we're... Uh, I just found out we got the go ahead to uh, do a cut on Grayson Lake WMA come this fall. That's close to home. Close that to is. Here. Yeah, that's close to here too. And you know what the public doesn't realize, and and I wish you know this were a smoother process, but things take uh, a while to develop. So we're on state land. We have a lot of procedures, a lot of red tape and paperwork to follow, but that stuff's there for a reason. So. The planning just takes a long time. When, you know, we were waiting on some archaeology results because we have to look at that stuff before we can just go in and willy-nilly start cutting or managing. So we got that done, so we'll be cleared to, to go in and do some good management come this fall. So pretty excited about that, too. Um, and then the other big thing I'm interested, I'm excited about is we're, we're uh, going to be getting some good information, some good forest inventory on uh, Grayson and Yatesville. Uh, several thousands of acres that we, we hope to do management and we're going to get good information, get a baseline of the timber that we've got there, values, volumes, uh, and so we can sit down and really plan out, okay, what's going to make most sense for grouse and other wildlife as far as cutting, burning, spraying invasive species, seeding log roads, those, those kind of things. Uh, you know, it takes time to develop, we got, but we got good people on the ground, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. Uh, one, and that's one thing people don't realize that if it's a natural disaster like ice storm or tornado, right. it happens quick. You know, you can't control it. That's right. But you guys have a lot of um, to to keep all groups happy and satisfied. Exactly. You all got steps you got to take, and mm -hmm. and it's sometimes hard for us as a public to understand that. Hey, why can't you just go out and start cutting trees and do this and that? Yeah. But you know, they they have a lot of. A lot of legalities that you guys got to go through just to um, help us hunters and sportsmen just to yep. get to the habitat. And um, I guess one of, the, one of the things I just want to ask you, you know, we're talking about it as a hunting aspect and grouse and stuff, but it also helps off small game. Oh, yeah. So the bird watchers, um, <coughs> people just enjoy small game in general. This habitat work, I mean, it benefits everybody. Oh, it does. Absolutely. And I try really hard to make that point when I'm talking to folks because, you know, in this day and age, uh, you've got to be aware of the other wildlife values because uh, there's too much infighting, both among hunters and among hunters and non-hunters, outdoor enthusiasts, and, and we don't have that luxury in this day and, day and age. we got to work together, and the fact is that a lot of grouse management it involves cutting trees, and that, that looks ugly right after harvest. But man, within just a, a year or two, there are certain songbirds that start responding. And as that cover develops, other, other songbirds come in and like it. Well, not to mention there's all kind of small mammals. There's uh, reptiles and amphibians. I mean, we don't like to see it come up on a rattlesnake accidentally. But the fact is, they like a lot of this cover too. They have a place in nature. Lord put them here for a reason. So all of it kind of works together. And we, we need a diversity of habitat, uh, just like we need a diversity of ideas and opinions. And, you know, you're talking about other hunters. We have to do a good job of educating people, and that's that's hard to do. You know, it's we all get the daily grind, and so we forget that not everybody has the luxury of thinking about this stuff. Uh, certainly, eight plus hours a day, nearly 24/7. I mean, yeah. I live and breathe it, and many hunters do too. But we get locked into our species, and grouse hunters in particular are diehards. But oh, you know, yeah. for every time we cut a tree, not only might we have uh, other interest groups on our case, we might have a squirrel hunter call and say, what in the world are you doing? You know, so we've, we've got competing interest battle there and uh, it's, it's not a battle. It's a, like I said, it's a matter of talking it out, educating and, and really convincing folks that to manage wildlife populations, we have to manage habitats and that really requires a diversity of different vegetation stages, ages, species of trees, bushes, briars, grasses, everything. All of it goes together, and uh, 
you know, it's going to benefit different species at different times and different ways, but we're mandated by law to manage all wildlife. And so we want the squirrel hunter to be happy. We want the bird hunters to be happy. Certainly young gener younger generations to get to experience small game just like they are deer and turkeys. Sure. Um, and that's just, um, it's kind of a challenge, like I said, to manage all the, not just the biological side, but also the human side. So. Yes, and, and you know, one thing I remember <coughs> whenever y'all got hired three years, or around three years ago that um, you and the Fish and Wildlife Department generally was really good about some town hall meetings. You actually went yeah. to several mm -hmm. organizations. I know the um, Ruffle Grouse Society plus the Kentucky Grouse Hunter Society yeah. Association, several other groups sure. that y'all would go and do your um, and what your your study was. Your what was it? Five ten year plan. Yeah, yeah, and, it's a uh, ten year plan. But really, it's kind of a. I'm hoping it will be a launching point to a much longer time span than that. Yeah, but but you're right. Gathering. Hearing out sportsmen, giving everybody a chance to talk at those open forums was was yeah. a big deal. And so. uh, if you want to touch base, I know yeah. what was it, two years ago mm -hmm. that um, most grouse hunters, they were, everybody out there may not be familiar or read right. about the West Nile virus. Yep. And um, actually, you sent these packets out mm -hmm. in your department to us hunters. Um, these available to everybody that wanted one. Yeah. And if you um, could kill grouse, he's lucky enough to harvest one. Yeah. That um, on the back side, you need highly instructions on what to do as far as filling out to get blood samples and what Zach and them would need to test for West Nile virus. So you all have worked really hard on every avenue to just to see at what mm -hmm. point and what's happened to a grouse. That's right, yeah. It. Yeah, some uh, research in recent years has, has come to light that has helped make a connection between rough grouse and, and West Nile virus. A few years before that, we'd gotten pretty good evidence that sage grouse out in western states, that they were seeing some, uh, some of the decline out there could, could be attributed to, the, to uh, West Nile, in addition to habitat loss. With these grouse, habitat is key and sort of the overarching most important thing. But the West Nile is, is apparently having an impact too. And so uh, Pennsylvania followed up some of the research with an effort to get blood samples from hunters. And so, um, yeah, two years ago, myself and my counterpart in Virginia for the uh, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, we decided to do what Pennsylvania has done and, and start this effort where we're trying to gather blood samples from hunters. So what we do is we send you an information packet, uh, like Larry said, and we'll send you a little, a little vial here with a little tiny strip of paper. So if you're, like I said, when you get your, your grouse carcass, open it up and you, you dip this little paper strip into it to get uh, saturated with blood. And then we basically take this, we'll send it off to a lab and they can put it in the machine to, to read it. And uh, what they're looking for uh, are antibodies to West Nile virus, meaning that that bird that was harvested had been exposed to West Nile virus and survived. It survived the disease uh, to be harvested. So it's kind of limited. Uh, the, you know, it's nature's hard to study. It just it is. So we don't. What's hard to tell about this so far is that we don't know in any one year if 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 there was necessarily a bad year for West Nile, meaning it was real prevalent across the landscape. Uh, was this bird weakened in any way? I mean, most grouse hunters, I've never heard anybody say that, you know, typically they don't slow down for you. So, no. uh, but, but at least we get an idea of that the disease is, is present in the population. And so we have detected West Nile both of the last two years, um, but it's at a pretty low rate of the samples that we've got. Um, but uh, Pennsylvania, they have, so Pennsylvania's a bigger state. They got a lot more grouse country. Um, they're doing a lot of active timbering up in, in the northern part of the state. They have a lot, still have more grouse hunters and, and more grouse than we do. And they've been able to get a lot more of these uh, samples. And so uh, I just heard from, from their biologist that unfortunately, um, it looks like they had a uh, pretty severe, well, they, they knew they did from some mosquito sampling they did last summer that it was a pretty rough year for West Nile. And sure enough, they've, they've seen their, uh, I think their flush rates are going to reflect that when they come out publicly, but uh, we haven't got our numbers crunched yet. But I'm hoping, hoping maybe the disease wasn't quite so bad here this time. Um, I, and I haven't got our, our flush rate data yet. That's the other thing, along with the West Nile, um, and 
you know, we talked about earlier something that hunters can do. I'm always trying to uh, pick grouse hunters' brains and, yeah. and get them to fill out a hunting log, you know. This is, uh, it's voluntary information, but it is so helpful to us because grouse are one of the hardest species to study. Uh, so hunters are really our eyes and ears on the ground, and so if we can look at the number of birds they flush uh, and the amount of hunting that they do, it gives us a, an index over time to gauge the population. Well, we're going to, uh, we always are in need of, of more data like that. So we're, of that we've got, we're going to be crunching that here soon, and hopefully I'll have a kind of a sense of how last fall went. I've, I've gotten sort of mixed stories from folks. I know, Larry, you said you went out and moved we, some birds We a went a few bit, times, you? moved a few birds, um, which is hopeful, you know. One of the biggest things I saw in fall, what little bit we got a grouse hunt, was young birds. Yeah. So I, I was feeling, that. That's I was excited. Sure. And um, me and my hunting partner, um, we already decided that we wasn't going to pursue to try to kill one just yeah. because the number of grouse. Um, it had the perfect point, perfect everything oh, yeah. to shoot one, and right. that just didn't happen. We we yeah. probably could have maybe shot shot at three of them, decent shot, and probably maybe killed one of them. But yeah. um, we somewhere around 15 birds that we we flushed, um, mm -hmm. which you know that don't that's not a lot compared to other states, but for the area and time we hunted, that was actually pretty good because we didn't right. have a lot of time in the woods. Yeah. Um, which which is exciting and it made me feel hopeful. Um, and then I've talked to a few other people that's kind of the same scenario, you know, that they've mm -hmm. moved a few birds this year. Yeah. And, um, but, I mean, we just talk about habitat and West Nile and et cetera. You know, it's kind of, if you, if you don't have habitat and I guess something like that hits in, it doesn't help nothing. I mean, it's oh, kind of like kick you while you're down. Absolutely. To the and that's the thing, you know, we, yeah. gosh. It, honestly, you know, in, in Wildlife 101 in college, when we start learning about what all affects wildlife populations, uh, one of the pretty basic tenets is that when population numbers are low and, and animals get spread far out and their populations are sort of in, in trouble, well, things definitely start to compound. So this West Nile threat is compounding. Uh, the lack of habitat or the, the habitat problem and you know there could be other diseases or other issues like that too. People talk about predators and there are certainly predators out there. Well if you had lots more habitat probably would help mitigate sure. the problem with predators. And, and so then hatching. I mean, oh and yes I want to get to that hatch. That was hatching. a great point. I'm glad you said that because that makes me feel great. You know some states they do brood surveys for grouse. Here that's just not practical to do. It's real it is extremely hard to, to note it to witness grouse, period, and uh, it's just hard, to, especially to do that in the summertime. But uh, what we do, we do collect information from volunteers across the state on, on turkeys, because they're more visible, they're out in the open. Yeah. And uh, our turkey hatch, based on information we got from, from last summer, indicates we had a better hatch especially across the state, but especially in central and east Kentucky. Uh, at least. Uh, the numbers we were seeing in July and August indicate it was considerably better than last year. Last year was one of our worst uh, hatches ever for turkeys. And because turkeys and grouse have a similar biology, it's not exactly the same, it's close enough that I hope the turkeys can sort of serve as a proxy, if you will, for grouse. And so I was hoping it would be a better year based on the reproduction and if you're seeing juveniles, that's, that's what we want to hear. So. Yeah. Uh, that's a, sort of from a grouse manager standpoint. Um, if you're harvesting a, a higher proportion of juveniles to adults, then that's that's what we want because those juveniles are help make hunting uh, uh, help make it sustainable over time. Sure. In other words, if we're only hunting older birds and we don't replenish, well, that's that's not going to cut it long term. Yeah. So. Yeah. And um, so. As far as like, I know um, you guys can only manage, manage public land because, mm -hmm. I mean, as far as can take the park fish and wildlife, they right. can only go and cut public land. Mm -hmm. But say if someone had several hundred acres of land and they wanted advice mm -hmm. on either clear cutting or selective or whatever harvesting to help create um, small yeah. game habitat, grouse, etc. Right. Um, can, can they come to you guys for advice? And Absolutely. Help yes. Yeah. yeah. So we have 
We have private lands biologists. That's, that's their job, is to provide free technical guidance to landowners. And um, those private lands biologists will come out to work with you. Um, they can write you a management plan, talk to you about how the process works. You can bite off as much as you want to chew on the type of habitat work you've got. Uh, they're going to most likely, if you if you got enough land and it's all set up right, then they're probably going to want to turn you on to some farm bill programs. These are run through the USDA that, and they can provide some really good cost share money to help offset the cost of doing some work. Uh, you really want to get a forester involved if possible. That's the very best thing is when you have a biologist and a forester both giving you good advice and assistance. And uh, whether that's um, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, they have a, a stewardship program where you know they have uh, foresters that will come out and give you assistance too. But there's also uh, consulting foresters. These are private foresters that uh, can come out not only inventory your woods, but they can also help you accomplish a timber sale. And they kind of act as your agent in a way, and, and that helps you get the most from your harvest, but it also helps make you achieve your goals. So if, you're, if I'm a landowner, most landowners uh, have more than just timber in mind. You know, they, they like wildlife. They, sure. You know, they own the woods for a reason, because they love being in the woods. Yeah. And so you, you want to manage in a, in a way so that that forest it will regenerate itself, it's renewable, uh, sustainable over time. Uh, providing habitat for wildlife as well as a great scenic place to go recreate. So that's the kind of thing that foresters and biologists both can give you advice on and, and I highly recommend that you consult with them before you do any kind of any kind of work just to help plan things out and, uh, and let you know what to and expect. And that's one thing I just want to get out there that we've spoke some that there are a lot of good options for people and there are a lot of good programs and yeah. it's and it's getting the public informed sure. to um, to search for those programs. Again, it's hard to navigate to finding out where that information is. So it don't is. hesitate to pick up the phone, call Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, and ask for your local private lands biologist. We also have farm bill biologists. That's what I used to do before I took uh, took this job. Uh, that's biologists that are stationed in USDA offices. So. Uh, They'll, you know, they could come here to the West Liberty Conservation District office and you can get some good information there. So there's kind of a network of conservation folks that can get you good information. But to make it simple, just pick up the phone and call Kentucky Fish and Wildlife and we will uh, we'll help turn you on to the people in your local area. So we'll do a little bit of recap and then I want to talk to you about one other thing before we close for the day. So y'all got quite a bit of good foot ground on habitat work starting starting out. We do. We got a long way to go. Long way to go. But we're doing all that we can now and Start. you know, really trying to set pave the way so that we can manage even better in the future. And then checking of course the West yep. Nile virus. Right. As much as you can. Um, and as you mentioned, really important if you hunt grouse, um, please turn your flush counts in. Yeah. Are they, um, can they email them? Are they a form Absolutely. they need to fill out? Yep. No, nope. they can do either one. Yeah, so, uh, That's what I did. I just emailed you. Yep, yep. yep. Feel free to email me. Uh, I'm real easy to get a hold of. Uh, Larry can get you that information sure. or I can read it off either one. But uh, Yeah, and we can um, possibly put it on put it on the show later, put your all's number and stuff. And, um, and not only that, it, I mean, you're only one person, and we all know that oh, funds are limited for every program, no matter right. if it's at my work, your work. Right. So the public can really help you by having boots on the ground, giving you the flush counts. Or absolutely, I know last year y'all did some drumming studies. Yeah, and you so, needed volunteers and help for that. Yep, and yep, we got some to help us. That was uh, that was very helpful. My my uh, and, um, Jeremy Williamson, my good friend, he, yeah, he helped me out. Great yeah, guy. actually, yeah. uh, bred my my female to his male, so I've seen some of those pups. These, these, yeah. They're good looking pups. Yeah, so. And you can, um, if if you need assistance with that, um, we'll have the number. And the way you can get hold of Zach and Fish and Wildlife on on this um, show it towards the end of it, about when you're always watching it. But you can contact them and possibly 
um, get with Zach, and Zach can lead you in direction of maybe an area that he might would like to see German counts in, or an area. Yeah, we'd love to have folks volunteering. Uh, when you're out. turkey hunting, turkey season's coming up. Yeah. Uh, I would really like to get turkey hunters just to keep that ear open. You're listening for gobbles. Why not also keep grouse in the back of, my, in your, of your mind? I know New York State. That's one way they monitor grouse up there. Is is they have get drumming counts from their turkey hunters. You know, when turkey so. season first came in and got to hunt, um, you heard it a lot more then as in the woods. You'd hear some grouse drumming. You'd always mm -hmm. be like sitting there, and then all of a sudden you'd hear that grouse are drumming. Oh, it's all yeah. you know is this nature Something and all that's it. great. It um, Zach, we really appreciate you coming, sitting in. Sure. Um, maybe we'll try to do a follow up in the fall and. Um, or maybe go, to, maybe set up and go to an area that you all started doing some work in and do some filming and show actually the public kind of what you guys are getting involved in. And um, but I can't thank you enough for coming out. Um, we'll try to help keep the public informed. And I know this necessarily we ain't sitting here cooking, but if if we don't have wildlife biologists and we don't have people out there. With, whether it's through Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife or whoever managing these animals for us to harvest and we don't work together to have these programs, then they're not going to be nothing, no seasons, nothing for us to cook. So um, you're going to be seeing some, maybe some more shows like this in the future from field to plate because the cooking's the fun part and we go out in the field to show some harvest but if we don't have biologists, we don't have people looking out for us and doing these studies and setting the season dates and kills and bag limits and et cetera, and then, then one day we may not have nothing to hunt. So um, I, we appreciate you all today. We thank Zach for coming. Um, we'll have numbers on that you all can reach Zach or the Fish and Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife to get involved in some of these areas and take advantage of this, guys. And ladies out there, if y'all own farm, if y'all own land, um, if it's private and you want to manage it, there are a lot of opportunities. You just gotta search for them a little bit or get the, to the right person. Zach, um, would you like to end with anything? Just like to say thank you, Larry, for again, for this opportunity. Uh, and you're right, working together is one of the most important things we can do. But if it weren't for sportsmen, we wouldn't have a job. You fund our agency, we get zero state tax dollars. So we depend on the sportsmen and hopefully we can all work together to better the research.